You can't keep picking up wounded rabbits on the side of the road. My mother said that to me the day of a particularly nasty breakup this week. It is probably the most profound thing anyone's ever said to me. When I was in my early 20s, I was coming back from work at a print shop and on the side of the road was this large white ball of fur using its forelegs to pull itself on its belly towards the grass. I pulled over to the side to see that it was a rabbit. A large female. Its back was broken and it was twisted horribly. And even as I write this, I remember how I felt in that moment and almost makes me cry. I had a box in my car that I was using to move into a new apartment, so I grabbed it and hastily moved to place the rabbit inside. I hurried home, hearing a poor thing crying the whole way. I tried to soothe its pain by telling it that it was going to be okay, but it wouldn't stop crying, and so it went on and on, the creature crying and I sitting next to it trying to make it stop, until it was at my mother's house. I approached her with the box containing that suffering creature, and my adult eyes were full of boyish tears pleading with her to help me. We called the vet nearby and she told me to come as fast as I could, so I did. She was on the other side of town in Bear, Delaware, and I was in Wilmington. I could have gone somewhere closer, but I had no money to pay a vet and this woman took donations, but asked for nothing up front. The rabbit was still crying in pain and when I pulled up in front of that house in the woods and pulled that box out, I was nearly inconsolable, but I took a deep breath, wiped the tears from my eyes, and tried to be stoic. But when the lady opened the door, all I could say was help me. Help me as if I was the one in pain. And I think in a way I was. She took the box from me and invited me into her home. She had many animals in cages, small critters mostly, that she was nursing back to health. I was hopeful, and I don't know what I was thinking was going to happen. I guess I thought she would perform some miracle of surgery on the rabbit and give it a tiny cast for its back and put rods up its spine. She took one look at the wretched thing and told me that it was best to put it down. I asked her if there was anything we could do for her, and she said that the best thing to do for the rabbit would be to end its suffering. The rabbit was breathing heavily when she put the needle inside it. The ambient pain was likely so intense that the rabbit never felt the pinprick, and its eyes went wide and frightened, so tired and soon, its breathing stopped one heavy breath at a time until it seemed to sigh into a deep sleep. I watched that rabbit die and it broke my heart. Ever since then I've been picking up wounded creatures only to have them die in my arms. I wanted to work on my review for Pathfinder a bit after my girlfriend left without warning. I wanted to do whatever it took to take my mind off that dark place that I go when rabbits die, but I couldn't. Her words kept reappearing in my head and I kept wondering if she was right about me. I realized that. In this state, there was no way I could concentrate on dialogue and strategy and so on. <sighs> you know, when things get hard in life, and your brain just won't shut off, sometimes all you need is a little... Flow. Gameflow is a topic that designers have been talking about in the industry for a while and many people have different takes on it. They mostly come at the topic from a purely design standpoint, meaning they're trying to create scenarios in a game that flow together nicely. I compare this type of thinking to commercial fiction versus literary fiction. Commercial fiction is all about keeping the reader engaged through rising and falling action, so it has a sort of cadence to it. In this chart it looks a bit like a sawtooth. With commercial fiction, you tend to want a serious event, action, or tension of some sort to happen in about every other chapter. And with each event, those stakes get higher and higher until the climax that finally releases all the tension, just like a lonely, single man might do into a towel. Don't forget to bring a towel! On every odd chapter, the action falls and the characters and our readers get a chance to catch their breath, only to have the tension renewed on the next chapter. Literary fiction tends to be all over the place with this. Introducing conflict and action in odd, heaving spits and spurts. Some literary fiction even looks like this. The point of literary fiction, usually, is to pull the rubber band of tension, as Tarantino put it, until it is just about to break, 
And then the action comes in and comes in hard and fast, giving sweet release, renewing that pulling of tension for a bit longer to end in a huge, body-trembling climax. Now, you might be thinking, Strat, thought this video was about Dusk. I'm getting to that, but first I have to talk about other games for a little while in order to give you some context, okay? Let's hear what recent retiree Cliff Bozinski has to say about game flow. Cliffy says that good flow depends on two factors. The first is that, although a puzzle must offer a challenge, it should not severely halt progress. The second is through offering appropriate rewards for solving those puzzles. I argue that this is one way to design flow, but it is designed the same way as interval reward systems, in that not every puzzle will offer the same reward and some will offer better rewards than others. That type of novelty tends to wear off around Act 2 when you are no longer getting as much dopamine. So in my opinion, it's not the best way to go about it. Let's take a look at a game that has been designed specifically around flow and see how it relates to our commercial fiction model. Uncharted 2 takes its commercial flow very seriously. Most successful commercial writers know that in order to grab a reader, they have to start with a compelling event, start big and end bigger. Uncharted 2 starts you off sitting in a chair, covered in blood, then within a few seconds you realize you're on a train and it's hanging off a cliff face. Drake falls out the back of it and the game starts. Most of this section has you partaking in a mundane set of climbing puzzles, but every now and then, a rock will fall, nearly sending you to your death. These are spikes in a rising and falling action. You climb up further, and just before things can get boring, a pole you're climbing up shears off the train and swings you to the side of it, forcing you to jump and grab on before you die. Another rise in action and tension. Just as you make it back into the car and start climbing the passenger seats, one of them comes loose of its moorings and sends you flying out the window and back outside the car. The camera deliberately forces you to look down into the chasm, which is the game's way of introducing more rising tension. This pattern repeats time and time again until each time it does, the stakes raise a little and things seem a bit more precarious. Just like our commercial fiction chart. At the end of this series of events, Nathan must run down the hall of the train car before it falls off the cliff, and the event culminates with Drake hanging off the ledge, scrambling to catch his grip until he's hanging off the ledge by one hand. Spoiler alert, he doesn't die, and eventually we're treated to a cutscene. Then another bombastic event at a train, then another cutscene. Guess what these cutscenes are? They are falling action. Uncharted 2 takes a page from the Dean Kuhn School of Writing, and its game flow looks something like this. Start with a big, bombastic set of events, and bring everything down and reset. This can be risky because the final event, in order to be satisfying, needs to be absolutely epic. And if the event that follows that opening bombast is something like, say, a stealth mission, your game's flow might be fucked like last week's towel. Don't forget to bring a towel! Cutscenes are how most games handle flow, unfortunately. They take control away from the player to show them something, and this is their break, their falling action. Or in the case of Uncharted, they use a combination of climbing puzzles, long stretches of walking through empty landscapes and corridors, and cutscenes as falling action, and as rising action they use... cover shooting. Dust flow looks something like this, and it's fucking awesome. Okay, I'm being unfair. Dusk actually has a very similar flow as Uncharted, but the way it handles falling action is much, much different, and the falling action never falls too far. I argue that Dusk designs its flow another way, a way that never takes control away from the player at any time, a type of design that is deliberately simple and unobtrusive and never gets in the way of its own fun. This type of flow is subliminal in nature, and lulls the player into a sort of meditative state where the only decision-making processes happening are automatic responses to stimuli, and the more deliberate systems of thought only kick in when dusk shifts from jibbing low-poly models into lower-poly models, and shifts to traversal-slash-exploration. Those are the moments when the game takes its foot off the gas for a moment so that the player can explore, find weapons, ammo, health, and secret areas, and most of all, to breathe and recharge. Dust can be broken up into two main activities, traversal and shooting. That's not to say that Dusk has boring design, hell no, farthest thing from it. 
Dusk does the most it can with its limited tool set and pushes far beyond expectations in many regards, but I believe the most important factor about Dusk's success is in how its levels are designed. Most levels combine two types of design. Corridors and arenas, both big and small. The pattern is run through an opening section, empty out into an arena, and once that arena is cleared, exploration begins. In traditional FPS fashion, you're looking for keys to open doors which are sometimes on the other side of the map and other times the arena acts as a series of entrances and exits that lead to keys that allow you to open up other parts of the arena. These types of maps loop back into themselves and usually lead you back to the main area. The cool thing about this is that the arenas you've previously been to repopulate with enemies whenever you trigger an event. And sometimes a combination of different enemies makes it so that there is very little drag in the action and ensures that old areas feel like new each time you visit them. Most maps in the first and the beginning of the second episode take on this structure, occasionally broken up by sections that take place in the dark where everything goes from an FPS to a horror game. And just when the player may start becoming bored with that type of structure, Dust throws in a map with rotating levels and changes geometry of places you've already been. Then, once you start getting tired again, Dusk throws in the City of Shadows. Then you can begin to see a pattern in how Dusk keeps you playing for so long. See, in games like Call of Duty, the monotony of cover shooting is broken up by turret sections, missions where you drop bombs from a FLIR jet with night vision from a mile above the ground, and the occasional vehicle section that is the same as a turret section except it's bombastic because it is meant to be set piece for a bigger action piece. In the Uncharted series, the monotony of cover shooting, climbing, and exploration is broken up by chase sequences, which are big scripted, bombastic sections full of things getting destroyed, near-death experiences, everything we've come to expect from a big budget action movie. The problem with both of these techniques is that it takes all the control away from the player. It disempowers them because the win condition isn't kill this guy or get this item or traverse the level in a certain way. It is usually memorize enough of this sequence to make it to the end. If the sequence is too hard, it frustrates players. If it's too easy, it feels like a slog. And if it's on rails, the player no longer has complete access to the entire arsenal of tools at their disposal. Dusk handles this all by varying up the design of levels so that old techniques that used to work no longer do. Old weapons you used to rely on have no ammo. And every four or five levels has a new, totally unique gimmick that at times when I ran across them, I had to scream out to my son, Hey Kane! Come take a look at this shit! By the time you might be getting tired of the levels, Dusk introduces jump pads. Got tired of that? Have a horror section. Tired of the horror? Have Escher Labs. Tired of the facilities? Have this totally dark world that opens up to a sunlit area with a boss battle with Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Whereas some games follow a formula from beginning to end, Dusk never stops innovating on what is already done. And for that, I give Dusk 10 crusty towels out of 10. This has been a rant from strategy and now that you heard it, stop picking up wounded rabbits and start eating them. <laughs>